All right, starting video of today's lesson, St. Athanasius Academy, and the class is Early African Christianity. Logging into the Zoom meeting now, which I probably have a couple of students waiting for me already. And I'm trying to use the camera in the proper direction. All right, so I got one to admit. Let's see. Da, 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 da. Breakout rooms, chat, meeting, chat. No. I don't need to chat. Um, I got an unstable network connection. I thought somebody was. Okay, so right now I'm the only participant. Admit. Okay. Hello, how are you? And I've got another camera aimed at me, so if it looks like I'm looking off, don't be, don't be put off by that. And I had emailed today's notes, so you might want to check your email for that and we're going to give people a couple of more minutes to come in got another student in good afternoon to you as well Okay, I'm getting a low bandwidth message. Are you all receiving me well? Is, is my image coming in good? Okay, all right. All right, we'll give it another two or three minutes for more people to come in. If you want to get your notes, if you want to get a snack, go right ahead. All right, I'm going to give two more minutes. I've been doing other videos from my study. And I had my Liverpool scarf up, and some people did not like that. Well, I'm sorry. I, I hope that scarf doesn't offend anybody. But, yes, I I do root for Liverpool. So, In American football, I root for the Atlanta Falcons. So I go from a winning team to a losing team. You don't win all the time in life, so 
That's why I picked the losers. Okay. And through the prayers of our Holy Fathers, Lord Jesus Christ, our God, have mercy upon us and save us. Thou who at the sixth hour and day was nailed to the cross for the sins Adam committed in paradise, take away from us the written record of our sins and grant us your great mercy. Lord, bless us in this time of worship through study. Reveal your truth to us that we may grow in your grace, your mercy, and your love. Amen. So, second part of the Council of Chalcedon, the big mess, which is probably the best way to describe it, because before Chalcedon, the church was pretty much one church. Um, Chalcedon is okay, all right. Well, I understand. No problem. Um, Chalcedon was the first major division in the Orthodox Church. Um, granted, there was the Third Ecumenical Council where Nestorius was deposed and that the Nestorians, in fact, they're still a Nestorian church to this day, but the Nestorians, the Nestorians did not have quite the same effect and quite the movement that the rest of the Oriental churches would have. And today I want to talk about that split between our two, our two churches, the Eastern Orthodox and the Oriental Orthodox. And the biggest bone of contention was the Tome of Leo. Leo was the Pope of Rome. He was the one that wrote a letter about Jesus being fully God and fully human, that he was fully divine and fully human, and that this would be the final decision of the church. And, and this is what was written. This was what was cried out after Leo's tome. And I'm taking this from the book Wade in the River from Father Paisius Ostel who is now Hieromonk Alexi. But these are the words that were said at the end of the council. This is the faith of the fathers. This is the faith of the apostles. So we all believe, thus the Orthodox believe. Peter has thus spoken through Leo, so taught the apostles piously. And truly did Leo teach, so taught Cyril. Everlasting be the memory of Cyril. Leo and Cyril taught the same thing, anathema, to him who does not believe. So the final decision in the Council of Chalcedon was not simply Pope Leo declaring what everybody must follow. Leo is not the one who by himself gives the final decision, but Cyril of Alexandria is quoted as being the one who speaks with the same voice as Leo, that there are two separate natures of Christ, but Christ being one being. And this is from the fifth act of the proceedings of the Council of Chalcedon. One and the same Christ, Son of God, 
the only begotten, recognized in two natures, without confusion, without change, without division, without separation, the distinction of natures being in no way annulled by the union, but rather the characteristics of each nature being preserved and coming together to form one person in substance, not as parted or separated into two persons, but one and the same son of the only begotten, I'm sorry, but one and the same son and only begotten God, the word, Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, the idea that Nestorius had that Jesus was two separate people is rejected. But the idea that Jesus, the divine, and Jesus, the human, becomes only one Jesus because his human nature no longer counts because he's fully divine. That idea of monophysitism has also been rejected. This is what Cyril taught. This is what Leo taught in his tome. And this should have been the end of the argument. Two problems. Problem number one, Dioscorus, who was Cyril's successor and the head of the robber council, that was the council held in Ephesus. Cyril did not show up for the um, council of Chalcedon. Cyril refused to participate. And had Cyril participated, he would have come to realize that he was wrong, that the idea of Christ being only one divine nature was wrong, and that um, Cyr Dioscorus, rather, Dioscorus was wrong, and that Cyril's de definition of two divine natures was the right way, and that Leo and Cyril both agreed. In the two divine nature, in the divine nature, in the human nature of Christ, fully divine, fully human, the two natures. Dioscorus was absent from that council. He was deposed as the head of the Church of Alexandria, and not only that, but even after this declaration that Leo and Cyril spoke the same, that Leo and Cyril both define Christ as being one being fully human and fully divine, there were still about 13 bishops and other clergymen from Alexandria, from Egypt, that rejected the tome of Leo. They rejected the ruling of the Council of Chalcedon, and they took their congregations with them to also stay away from what was declared in Chalcedon. Now, the Council of Chalcedon, and again, the idea was to bring that council to the east. Originally, Leo wanted that council to be held in Rome. It wasn't held in Rome. It was held um, in Chalcedon, just outside of Constantinople. That would mean that you're not trying to just railroad one idea into everybody's heads, that one idea was not going to be um, 
was not going to have an unfair advantage, that Leo was not going to have an unfair advantage. And he didn't. But unfortunately, it was seen that way. First of all, that Constantinople was near enough to Chalcedon. And Constantinople, of course, as I said before, that there's a rivalry, that there's a rivalry, a rivalry between Alexandria and Constantinople. So whatever was going to be decided, somebody from Alexandria was not going to be satisfied. Somebody from Egypt was not going to be satisfied. The Antiochians, they were satisfied because the tome of Leo, the um, words of Cyril were still words that they understood. The two natures, not two physical beings, but two natures. The Antiochians understood this. They went along with it. Of course, the Roman church went along with it as well because of course, Pope Leo was the one that wrote the tome. But still, the Egyptians considered this to be a betrayal of Cyril. Never mind the fact that Cyril's name comes up several times in the final proclamation. The thing is that the Egyptians still did not want to have... Leo's name attached to it. They only wanted to have Cyril's name attached to it, even though Cyril was dead. But not only was this rejected by um, the Alexandrians, the Syriacs, those just outside of Antioch, sided with the Egyptians because to them, it still sounded like, and I'll use the words that, um, that they used as well, it sounded like a rehabilitation of Nestorius. That word, physis, P-H-Y-S-I-S, -S, it sounded too much like physical. So immediately, the divisions set in. These divisions were prompted by two other factors. Factor number one, an anti-Hellenistic or an anti-Roman nationalism. an anti-Hellenistic and an anti-Roman nationalism. Keep in mind, Egypt, you're talking about one of the great kingdoms, one of the great empires, one of the great peoples of the world. They had been conquered by the Macedonians, the Greeks had settled into their territory. Then, of course, the Romans would eventually conquer them as well. But the thing is, those elements of national pride never left the minds of many Egyptians. To many Egyptians, it's like, hold on now. We're, we're the ones that built all this great stuff. Look at all of our pyramids. Look at the fact that we are, again, Alexandria, center of learning, Nile Valley, center of agriculture, and you all think you can tell us what is right and what is wrong? No. So that you had nationalism coming from um, the Egyptians, but you also had nationalism coming from the Syriacs as well. After all, um, you had the Assyrian Empire, you had the Babylonian Empire, you had kingdoms that were there long before, you know, back when Rome was just an upstart little village. So with this 
sense of nationalism, there would be an idea that we want to see our kingdom rule the day, at least let us rule the day in decisions of religion. Um, there is an image of the Byzantine Empire that the Byzantine or the Eastern Roman Empire was one big united um, kingdom. But the truth of the matter was there were still plenty of divisions. Um, just like in in the American history, you look at some of the causes of the Civil War. Um, of course, slavery was an obvious cause, but you also had the cause of a Southern nationalism as well. You know, it's like, how dare you Yankees tell us what to do? And after all, some of you Yankees are slave owners as well. So the idea of nationalism was a problem. But a second problem was an independent monasticism, an independent monasticism. Keep in mind, the Desert Fathers were not people that were ordained either by Rome or by Constantinople. The Desert Fathers were a conglomerate of people from all over the empire that moved to the deserts of Egypt and also to the deserts of the Middle East to repent of their sins and gain holy virtues. So the monastic movement was an anti-imperialistic movement. And now the empire is going to tell them how to think about God? And even if the empire was right, in which it was, still, there was a resentment that these monastics had that all of a sudden Rome and Constantinople are joining their forces together to try to dictate our beliefs. And that's something that they did not want. So you had ethnic division, you had an independent monasticism mixed in with this decision coming from Rome and seemingly coming from Constantinople as well, which Constantinople is known as the second Rome. Now you can imagine if you have this kind of rivalry between Alexandria and now with Syriac allies versus Rome and Constantinople that it's not simply going to be um, some sort of um, peaceful, amiable debate. But unfortunately, this will be a division that is going to draw some serious bloodshed. Patriarch Proterius was elected to be the head of the church in Alexandria after the deposing of Dioscorus. This patriarch was cornered into a building, I think it was a church, along with a security force that was sent to protect him. They were barricaded inside of the building, and the building was burned by an angry mob. So those in Egypt and in Syria that supported the ruling of Chalcedon were persecuted. But also, on the other hand, those who didn't support Chalcedon were also persecuted. Um, again, you had many monastics um, among the Syrians, but especially among the Egyptians, 
that were against the ruling of Chalcedon. And the Roman emperor would send troops into those monasteries, brutally closing the monasteries and torturing, and in some cases, killing the monks that lived there. This division, the, this time of division, would also be met with serious efforts to try to bring the churches together. First of all, that the so-called Monophysite churches, the Egyptian Copts, the Copts, the Syriacs, who opposed Leo's tone, who opposed um, the Council of Chalcedon, its final ruling, also opposed Eutyches. Again, Eutyches um, was that monk from Constantinople that said that no, um, Jesus had to have been one being um, all um, divine because whatever human nature he had, his human nature was absorbed into his divine nature, uh, monophysitism. And not long after, not long after the decision at Chalcedon, especially during this time of violence, um, the, many of the clergy in Egypt, many of the clergy in Syria would look and revisit Chalcedon and determine that, yes, Eutyches was wrong. That, of course, Eutyches um, was wrong because even, especially among the Egyptians, Cyril of Alexandria clearly said two natures, two natures of Christ. So on one hand, these, what we would now call Oriental Orthodox churches, wanted to uphold Cyril. But on the other hand, there was Leo. And not that Leo was wrong, because Leo pretty much said the same thing that Cyril said, but the problem was Leo was a Roman. He was the Roman Pope, and we don't want the Romans telling us what to do or how to think about God. So they tried to have their cake and eat it too, which many clergy, even the patriarch of Constantinople, um, Acacius, Acacius served as the Patriarch of Constantinople up until 484 AD, he constantly looked for some way to bring the monophysite, the so-called monophysite believers into the church, back into the church, especially since they didn't believe in monophysitism. Monophysitism was really just a launch pad for some political grumblings and also um, for some nationalistic idealism. But still, Acacius thought that there would be some way that they could work the language to have those churches in Egypt, those churches in Syria, and for that matter, also the church in India, um, the Malachandra Orthodox Church. Yeah, they, they're also a part, and the Armenians, and the Armenians, um, they're also a part of the what we now call the Oriental Orthodox Church. But Pope Felix would not have any of it. Um, Felix would be the pope that would, um, that would succeed Pope Leo, and in 484, because um, 
Acacius did not um, denounce the Monophysite churches, he was deposed as well. So what we have as a result of this division, not only do you have a patriarch of the Chalcedonian or what we now call the Eastern Orthodox Church in the Syriac, among the Syriacs and in Egypt among the Copts, but you also have a non-Chalcedonian patriarch in Alexandria. You have a non-Chalcedonian patriarch among the Syriacs. And these two patriarchates, these two patriarchs in these patriarchates would be the dividing line between Eastern and Oriental. Um, and unfortunately, it's a division that still goes on today. Even though, if you take the time to listen to some of the um, some of the recordings, especially on YouTube, by some of these Oriental Orthodox um, clergy, they will tell you, yes, Jesus is of two natures, but he is one divine being. They will tell you that Jesus is of these two natures in an unconfused union. So if they believe the same thing we in the Eastern Orthodox Church believe, why do we still have a division? A couple of reasons why we still have a division between us. Um, number one, cultures. As I stated earlier, the there was an anti-Hellenistic and anti-Roman nationalism that was still present among the Syrians, among the Egyptian cops. Now, with this nationalism, this rejection of what is Greek, this rejection of what is Roman, there's more of a tendency to try to lean more towards your own culture. Um, in particular, if you visit the Ethiopian Orthodox Church, not only are the services mostly in Amharic, but their scripture is written in this language, Giz or Giz, which is not even a language that's really spoken much in Ethiopia. But then on the other hand, you go to some um, Greek Orthodox churches and even some Antiochian Orthodox churches, and the language is going to be halfway in Greek or Arabic, or in some cases, all Greek and Arabic. So there's always these little ethnic circles that we prefer to be in. Um, our late patriarch, um, I'm sorry, our late metropolitan in the Antiochian church, Metropolitan Philip of, ble of blessed memory, he said that one of the biggest problems about evangelism in America among the Orthodox is because we all stick in our own little Orthodox ghettos. Those were his words. We all stay, we tend to stay in our Orthodox ghettos rather than to reach out to one another. And one of the main problems of the division that we currently have is that we still pretty much want to stay in our own little circles. But on the other hand, there are cases where we have expanded beyond our little circles. For example, um, St. Vladimir Seminary 
has a series of books now written by Coptic authors. In fact, they had reprinted one book in particular by one of the late um, popes of the Coptic Orthodox Church, Pope Shenouda II. Brilliant book, by the way. Brilliant book. Also, in the Antiochian Orthodox Church, um, the Antiochian House of Studies, which is a, it's a, um, I guess you would call it a distance learning um, program for those interested in becoming clergy, clergymen. We have Coptic studies in, in the House of Studies. So we do have places where we share um, perspectives, especially the church from 33 AD to 451 AD. We have the same saints, especially um, the Desert Fathers. And the Desert Fathers are not only key for us in the Eastern Orthodox Church, they almost even more so for the Coptics, because if you think about it, that's where the monasteries named after these great saints are located. Where is the Monastery of St. Anthony, the first monastery of St. Anthony? It's in the desert between the Nile River and the Red Sea. So the Coptics really embraced the Desert Fathers, but we also embraced the Desert Fathers as well. And even some modern writers, even some modern monastics. Has anyone ever heard of Matthew the Poor? Matthew the Poor... If I'm not mistaken, he was a copt. He was originally a pharmacist. <laughs> yeah, he started off as a pharmacist before he became a monk in the Coptic church. There are at least three books from Matthew the Poor that have been published by Ancient Faith Publishing, which is an Eastern Orthodox publishing house. So there are these places where we share um, a lot of our spirituality in common. And especially in the Middle East where you have violence against Christians. There was a patriarch of the Syriac Orthodox Church. I want to say it was Bishop John was his name, or Archbishop John, who was kidnapped by a terrorist group, by a Muslim terrorist group, um, along with the Metropolitan of Aleppo, who was an Antiochian. So we both suffer persecution together. We both have a similarity when it comes to the wisdom of monasticism and especially the Desert Fathers. We both share some of the same saints, those saints from 33 AD to 451 AD, but then we also have some different saints as well. Dioscorus was deposed in the Eastern Orthodox Church, but Dioscorus is a saint in the Coptic Church. There was a group of seven monks who followed Eutyches that after they were deposed, they went from Syria into Ethiopia. And to this day, the seven monks are considered saints. 
in the Ethiopian church, but our church does not recognize them because of them being supporters of Eutyches. So in our interactions with the um, Coptics, with the Ethiopians, um, there are some similarities, there are some differences. And talk to your priest, talk to your bishop about how far you can go with um, your interactions with one another, because there are some protocols that we should follow, and then there are some places where we should occupy common ground. In particular, because of this division between the cops, in particular, and the Eastern Orthodox Church, Missionary work and evangelization on the African continent became more dominated by the Coptic and the Ethiopian perspective. In fact, um, I was recently made aware that the Yoruba tribe the Yoruba tribe is one of the largest tribes in Nigeria, West Africa, that some of their artwork was influenced by the Coptic Church. And that there have been some um, remains of Coptic churches and Coptic worship houses around the Lake Chad region of West Africa. And up until, and I'm going to talk more about this later on as our class closes, but up until about the 14th century, there was actually a kingdom um, within the kingdom of Mali, the great West African kingdom of Mansa Musa, that even though Mansa Musa's kingdom was Islamic, that they received some of their tribute gold from a nation of Christians along the Senegal River. And chances are that was also of Coptic origin. But the division, as I said, still remains. Um, the division remains even though both the Oriental and the Eastern Orthodox point to Cyril and his explanation that Christ was fully human and fully divine. And even though the name of Cyril has been repeated time and time again in the final rulings of the Fourth Ecumenical Council, the Egyptians said that the council was a betrayal of Cyril. And the Syriacs believed that the Council of Chalcedon was a rehabilitation of Nestorius. Ethnic divisions were behind the split. There was an anti-Hellenistic and anti-Roman nationalism among the Egyptians and among the Syrians, and independent monasticism saw the ruling of Chalcedon as being an infringement on their ability to follow God as they saw fit, as they saw as the truth. Violence was committed by both sides as anti-Chalcedonian, non-Chalcedonian Egyptians would persecute um, Patriarch Protherius, in fact, burning him to death in 457, but also Monophysite-leaning monks in Egypt were also arrested, tortured, and sometimes killed. Eutychism was denounced and still is denounced by the Oriental Orthodox but they don't accept the tome of Leo. Again, that whole anti-Rome thing. 
Patriarch Acacius of Constantinople sought compromise, but the Pope Felix would have him deposed because he failed to denounce monophysitism. And because of this division, Coptic Egyptian Christianity would, would be the dominant influence in Ethiopia, in Nubia, and in any church below the Sahara Desert. And that's it for our lesson for today. I thank you for joining me. Thank you for taking the time. And again, the notes should be in your email. And may God bless and keep you. Amen. Everybody have a good day. Have a good day. Thank you for attending.